So when we want to find the range, a lot of times we're going to find a snag because we don't know what the graph looks like. Now, again, it's pretty simple. When we know the graph looks something like this, then we know that the domain is going to be all real numbers, right? Because the graph is expanding to the left and to the right. And the range is going to be all real numbers from negative three all the way to infinity, right? We're basically looking at how low does graph go to how high does it go? And we're going to exclude any gaps or holes in the graph. But what about when we just have an equation? How do we understand or how do we find the range? And the answer I want to work with you in this video is to find the domain of the range. Because again, it's very important to understand the relationship between a function and its inverse. The domain of a function is the range of its inverse. And the range of a function is the domain of its inverse. And again, just to give you a quick little example, if I was going to give you a function like f of x equals a 2x plus 2, right? And we were to go ahead and say, all right, well, what does that graph look like? Well, that graph is going to have a y-intercept of a positive two, and then it's going to go up two to the right two. So we go here, right? And then go over two, up one. So that graph looks something just like that, right? Beautiful. Now, what if we wanted to find the inverse? Like how do we find the inverse of this function? Well, the step-by-step -step process for that is just to go ahead and replace the f of x with y. So I have a y equals a two x plus two. Now we're going to go ahead and swap the variables, which is basically like swapping the domain in the range, right? Because if you think about if the domain is the x values or the input values and the range is the y value or the output values, if you're swapping the x and the y's, you're really swapping the domain and the range. And again, we'll go ahead and verify this once I go ahead and find the inverse. Now we just go ahead and solve for y. So I'll subtract a two on both sides a x minus two equals a two y, and then we divide by two, and I get a y equals a one half minus one, which I can rewrite as a f inverse of x is equal to a one half x minus one. Now, if I wanted to go ahead and graph that, I now have a y intercept right here of negative one, and I'm gonna go up one over two, okay? Now you might not say, I'm not really seeing a relationship here between this function and its inverse. But if I kind of like connect these a little bit longer here, then you might be able to see there's some kind of symmetry that's going on here, right? We could probably draw a nice little dashed line that's kind of going right in between those functions. Now, this dashed line is y equals x. Any function and its inverse are symmetrical. They're flipped about this y equals x line. What's also important is I want you to notice that the coordinate points, right, are swapped. Notice on this graph, we have this coordinate point here of zero comma two. Well, guess what's a point over here? Two comma zero, right? If this is the X and this is the Y and this is the X and this is the Y, notice how those coordinates got swapped. And that's gonna be true for any two points. Look at this point. This point is what? So one over one, two, three, four. So this point is a one comma four. Is there a point four comma one? One, two, three, four, up one right? Do you see it? Do you see how these two points, and that's going to be true for all of them. So when we want to be able to identify the range of a function and we don't know what the graph looks like now in this one, it's not really necessary, right? Because we know the domain and the range is all real numbers because it's a linear equation. But if the domain is restricted and we don't know what the graph looks like, an easy way to be able to find the range is just to find the domain of its inverse. So let's just go and take a look at a couple of examples and be able to identify how we can find the domain and the range of a function. Okay. And this first example, I love this example because we just talked about finding the inverse inverse, right? We just talked about restrictions on the domain. You can't take the square root of a number. You can't divide by zero. Again, we're thinking about this in terms of a f of x, right? Not y. Remember, x is our input value. What numbers can I plug in for x? Or is there any issue for numbers that I plug in for x? And as you start to think about that, all we're doing with our input values is we're raising them to a power, right? Cube, squared, first power. And then we're multiplying by them by a number. Is there any restrictions to numbers we can't use for x? And then slowly, as you start to get a value, you realize, oh, there is no restrictions, right? We can't, we're not taking the square root of any negative numbers and we're not divided by zero. This cubic function actually has a domain of all real numbers, right? I have no idea what this graph looks like, and I'm not even going to spend the time graphing it. I automatically know that the domain is going to be all real numbers. To understand the range, you do need to have a general understanding of what a cubic graph looks like. And this cubic graph, at least knowing the end behavior, is going to have a general shape of what we call the S curve. And it's going to look something like this. All right. Now it's again, that's not the most beautiful S curve that you, that's ever around, but I want you to notice something. The domain is all real numbers, right? There's no holes. There's no asymptotes. There's no gaps in the graph, but look at the range, just kind of like the linear graph. This graph goes down to negative infinity and goes up to positive infinity. So I don't need to find the inverse. I don't need to worry about that by just having a general understanding of domain and restrictions and having a general understanding of what the graph looks like and the range as a negative infinity by infinity. All right. So now let's go and take a look at an example like this. Now you might know what this graph looks like. You might not, but so let's just pretend that you don't so we can go through the process of finding the domain as well as the inverse. Now to find the domain, again, remember, we do not want our radicand to be less than zero because we cannot take the square root of a negative number. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say three minus X has to be greater than equal to zero, right? Now I can just go ahead and solve. I'll just add an X to both sides, right? So three has to be greater than equal to a X. And I can just swap this around as X has to be less than or equal to a three. Okay. So my domain is going to be all values that are less than or equal to three. I can go ahead and do a number line if you just want to like 
verify, you know, that what that works looks like. Here, here's three, right? Here'd be like two, here'd be four. It's greater than or equal to, so that's gonna be a closed dot and that's gonna be going to the left, okay? So that'd be a negative infinity all the way to a three. What about the range? Well, again, to find the range, we need to find the domain of its inverse. So the first thing we need to be able to do is find the inverse of this function. So what we're gonna do is say, all right, well, what is G inverse of X? All right, so again, we can replace the G of X with the Y. That's just gonna make the math a little bit easier. And then we have a three minus X. And now I'm gonna go ahead and swap my variables, right? Because remember the domain and the range are swapped or they are reflected about the Y equals X line. So I have an X equals a three minus a Y. So now let's go ahead and solve for my Y. So the first thing I'll do is I'll square on both sides. I get an X squared equals a three minus Y. So therefore then I will add a Y to both sides and I get Y plus a X squared is equal to three. And then you can just subtract an X squared on both sides here and you get Y equals a negative X squared plus three. Now, most students will just say, oh, there's my inverse, right? So G inverse is going to equal that. Hopefully, if you knew what this graph looks like, you'd recognize there's an issue going on. We need to do something more here. And the answer to that is, yeah, we need to apply some restrictions because you need to know what the square root graph looks like. If I have Y equals a square root of X, we need to know that that graph looks like as well as the inverse. So here, square root of X, that graph is going to look something like that, right? Now the inverse, if you were to reflect that about the Y equals X line, is gonna look something like this, right? So some kind of line here, this would be Y inverse, okay? What I want you to understand here is we have a quadratic. We have a graph that looks like that. That's not the same graph, right? So what we need to do is we need to be able to restrict what is going on here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna graph this equation, right? And then I'm gonna show you what this inverse, what this graph is going to go ahead and look like. So to graph here, the square root of three minus X, what I recognize here is there's a couple different ways you can go ahead and look at that. So G of X, right, is equal to a square root of a three minus X. Now what I can do is I can just rearrange that. So therefore that's gonna be a negative X plus three. And then I can factor out my negative, which is gonna give me an X minus three. Okay, so it's basically this graph, the square root graph, but it's being reflected about the Y axis and it is being shifted three units to the Right, so this graph is actually gonna look something like this. So one, two, three, and that's being shifted three units to the left, so it's gonna look something like that, right? Now this satisfies the mode domain. If you look at the domain of this, you're gonna say all real numbers that are less than or equal to three. And what do we find algebraically? All real numbers less than or equal to three. So we're good here. Now let's go ahead and graph on the same set of axes, the inverse function. So the inverse function we said was a negative X squared plus three. So that's gonna have a Y intercept of three. So that's gonna be one, two, three. And then negative X squared, if you kind of remember, that's just gonna be an upside down parabola, right? So it's gonna be going to the left and to the right here, and then over two, down four, one, two, three, four. So these points here. So if I can try to do my squigglies as best I can, this graph is gonna look something like that. Okay. Now, obviously my graph is not perfectly going through the points, but I want you to understand something. Remember what we talked about, this diagonal line, y is equal to x. Obviously we cannot have both parts of this function is going to be the inverse, right? So I want you to see is like, there's only a part of this, the graph that's part of the inverse. And what I want you to recognize here is this point one, two, three, three comma zero. And then this point is zero comma three, right? Anything to the left of this is not really a reflection of my original graph, right? Here's this original graph. If you were to reflect this graph, and again, you got to visualize this, you would get this portion of the graph. You would not get that portion. So what that means is this equation is correct, but what we need to do is restrict the domain of its inverse. G inverse of X is going to be a negative X squared plus three, but it's only going to be de defined for positive values, right? It's only going to be defined for this side of the graph. So therefore I can say X has to be greater than or equal to zero. So it's very, very important that we include this restriction on the inverse, because again, that is going to be the restriction on the domain. So again, remember, that's what our goal was. Our original goal was to find the domain in the range. So if my domain is going to be this and my range is going to be the domain of this function. Now, again, that domain of the function is restricted on the interval of zero to two. So guess what? That's going to be my range of my original function. The range here is going to be from zero to infinity, right? It's that restriction. And again, like look at the original equation, guys. Look at this original function, right? This was my G of X. What is the domain and range of that graph? right? The domain is all real numbers less than three and the range is from zero to infinity. So you can see how it works with the relationship between your domain and your range. So let's go and take a look at a problem like this, right? We have H of X equals X minus five divided by X plus two. And again, knowing our main restrictions guide, let's just focus on finding the domain first, right? Forget about the range for a second, find the domain. What is our only restriction on our input values? Well, we have no restrictions on the numerator, right? We can plug in X in for anything and just subtract five, right? There's no restriction there. However, we know when we're dividing by a number, we can't divide by zero. So to find my restriction, I want to find the values that make my denominator equal to zero. So X plus two is equal to zero. 
subtract two, subtract two, X is equal to a negative two. Now, again, those are the values that makes my denominator equal to zero. Those are the values that are not in my domain. And again, I could, there's no better way I can describe this or show this to you than except by using a number line. So negative two is not defined in my domain. There's no other restriction that I notice here that we're going to have. So my function is going to be defined for all other values, right? From negative infinity to positive infinity. So therefore I can say from negative infinity to negative two, my function is defined, right? But again, two is undefined. So therefore that's why I'm using my parentheses. And then over here, it's from negative two to infinity. Again, the function is undefined. Therefore, again, we'll use the union symbol. So that is going to be my domain. Now, what about the range? Remember the range is the domain of the inverse. So we have to be able to figure out what is the inverse of H of X. So to go ahead and do that, again, we're going to do the same process we did in the last example. I'm going to replace Y with X just to make the math a little bit easier. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and swap my variables. So X equals a Y minus five all over a Y plus two. Now, again, you could also graph this equation if you know what this graph looks like. But again, you're going to have to be pretty confident in knowing what the graph looks like to be able to identify the domain and the range because I'm definitely some pitfalls that you can make when applying that process. So algebraically, we can be sure that we're going to have the correct domain and range. To solve for Y, I need to get the Y off the bottom. So therefore, I'm going to multiply by y plus two on both sides. Now in this example, I'm actually going to distribute the x as well. So therefore I get a y x plus a two x equals a y minus five, right? Because those are going to divide to one. Now the main idea we want to solve for y, right? So I'm going to get the y's to the same side and I'm going to get the two x here over to the other side. So therefore I have a y x minus y equals a negative two x minus five. I can't combine these because they're not like terms. So the only way I can get a singular y is to factor out a y because they both do share a y, right? So when I factor out a y, I get a x minus one is is equal to a negative two X minus five. Now I can divide by the quantity X minus one on both sides. And therefore I get a Y equals a negative two X minus five divided by an X minus one. Now, unlike the last example, this looks like this could be the range. I know I'm, I'm not dealing with two different functions, right? I'm not going from a square root function to a quadratic function. These are both going to be rational functions. So therefore I just need to find the domain of this. Now, again, I can rewrite this using my inverse notation, which is going to be an H inverse of X. And now let's just go and find the domain. Well, here again, guys, where's going to be our restriction? Do we have any restrictions in our numerator? I can plug any number in for X, multiply by negative two, subtract five, multiply by negative two, subtract five. There's no restriction, right? Our main restrictions are taking the square root of a negative number and dividing by zero. I know I'm going to be dividing by zero for whatever values make my denominator equal to zero. So X minus one is equal to zero. You probably could have done this in your head. X is equal to one. So again, using kind of the number line approach, basically it's the exact same thing as this, except instead of negative two, it's going to be one. So to save ourselves a little bit of time, I'll say that range is going to be the domain of this. So the domain of the inverse function is negative infinity to one union one to infinity. Well, that's the range of my original function. So negative infinity to one union one to infinity. And yes, if you know anything about these graphs, those are going to be your asymptotes, your vertical and your horizontal asymptotes. Okay. In this restriction, we actually have a domain restriction already. So the cool thing is like finding the domain is the easiest thing ever. The domain is literally what your restriction is. So it's all numbers greater than or equal to three. So cool three to infinity. Done. Now, how do I find the range and what is this restriction? How does this impact the graph? To find the inverse, it's not really going to make an impact, but for us to kind of like mentally understand what's going on, we do want to be able to look at this through the graphical approach. So therefore we can kind of verify we're getting the right solution. So we'll go ahead and tackle that after we go ahead and find the inverse, but let's go and find the inverse of this function here. So F inverse of X. So again, we're going to follow in the same process. We're going to swap F of X with a Y and therefore I'm having two times X minus three quantity squared plus one. Don't need to worry about the restriction at the moment. Let's swap the X and the Y's, and then we're just going to go ahead and simplify for a Y. Now, again, just using my inverse operations here, I'm going to subtract the one on both sides. So X minus one equals a two times Y minus three quantity squared divide by two divide by two. I'm going to rewrite that two in front. Okay. So therefore that's going to be a one half X minus one. Um, and that's going to equal to a Y minus three quantity squared. Now, when I take the square root, it's very important. We need to understand we have the plus or minus in this case. So that's going to be an X minus one is equal to a Y minus three, and then we'll add a three. Okay. So we have a lot going on here, right? So I have a Y equals a plus or minus the square root of a one half X minus one quantity squared close parenthesis or close radicand plus three. Okay. Now, if you remember anything about a function, right, that we talked about, that we talked about originally, like wherever input, you can only have one output. And so that's an issue when we have this plus or minus, we need to pick which one is it? Is it the positive or the negative? We can't do both because if we did both, then this would not be a function. And therefore the function would be non-invertible. So that's why we had this domain restriction. That is what is making this function invertible. This graph here is going to over three. So one, two, three, all right, up one. Okay. There's going to be your vertex. And then, you know, we're having some kind of graph is going to look something like this. Now this graph 
does not pass the horizontal line test. For a function to be invertible, it has to pass the horizontal line test, meaning it's going to be a one-to-one -one function. What happens here though, is notice this graph is not on its all domain. The domain only said from three to infinity. So what's actually going on here is the graph is only going to be defined for gra values greater than three. So this whole left-hand side of this graph is not going to be defined. That's very important because now you can see the graph does pass the horizontal line test. I can draw a line anywhere and it would not intersect the graph more than once. Now, what does that say about the inverse function? Now you might look at this and say, I don't want to graph that. And I don't blame you. That doesn't look like a very fun function to be able to go ahead and graph. But in reality, besides like the one half, which is really just a stretch or compression, all we're doing is we're taking the square root function, right? Which is this little graph and we're shifting it up three and to the right one. So we're going up three. So up three, one, two, three, to the right one. Now, remember, any function and its inverse are reflective about the y equals x line, right? Now, this plus or minus, what is that doing as a, re as a reflection? Well, if I say a negative square root of x, right, that's the square root of x. What would the negative square root of x look like? The negative square root of x would look something like this, right? So basically what I have here is I have two graphs that look either something that's going to be like that or like that. So which one actually looks like a reflection about the y equals x line? Well, this one does, right? Not this one. I'm not going to include both these. And again, that like this inverse is not a function, right? I think you guys can agree. Like that's not an inverse. That doesn't, this inverse of the plus and the minus doesn't pass the vertical line test. So what we can do is we can just eliminate this bottom version. So the F inverse of my function is just going to be the positive version of this function. So that's going to be a one half X minus one plus three. I don't know why I'm writing such a big radical here, but that's going to be the inverse function. What is going to be the domain of this inverse, right? Now, again, remember when we talked about the domain, the domain of a radical is you can't take the square root of a negative number. So all you're simply going to do is take one half times X minus one, right? And set that greater than or equal to a zero, right? And now we just need to solve. So to solve this, I can multiply by two on both sides. I get X minus one is greater than or equal to zero, add one, and therefore what I get is X is going to be greater than or equal to one. So the domain of my inverse function is X is greater than or equal to one, right? Now, how does that look on a number line? Well, again, we can just go to one as all values greater than or equal to. So that's going to be a filled in dot going into the right. So that's going to be a one to infinity. So this is going to be all values that are greater than one. But remember the domain of your inverse is the range of your original function. So let's make sense. Does that work for this function? And you can notice that yeah, look at the domain of my inverse function is one to eight. Is that the range of my original graph? Look at, yeah, one all the way up to infinity. So we can say here the range by looking at the graphical approach, but also verifying and validating it using the algebraic approach with the inverse, I can be able to identify my range here is going to be from one to positive infinity. So hopefully this was helpful when you need to find the domain and the range and you don't know what the graph looks like. Again, just find the domain of the inverse of the function to help you find the range of the function. Now, not all problems is that going to work for. The more complicated the examples get, the more difficult it is to be able to find the range using the method that we discussed in this video. So in the next video, what I want to do is focus on showing you how do you find the domain of a function when you have multiple restrictions, more than what we've covered up to this point. So if you're interested in that video, go ahead and check it out here. Or if you just need more examples of finding the domain of the range of a function, Go and check out the examples I have for you down below. Cheers.